Hi, I'm Dr. Paul Jaffe of the Naval Research Lab, and I am excited to be here to share my team's vision of a transformational innovation for defense, development, and diplomacy. Our lab has been a leader in space for over 57 years. We were the first to fly solar cells in space. We brought you GPS, and we discovered ice on the moon. Today, we are also working with DARPA to revolutionize space operations through robotics. We want to bring you a profound new capability to enable the next American century. Energy. It's the lifeblood of modern civilization. What if we could provide clean, constant energy anywhere in the world on demand to the soldier on the mountaintop, to the farmer in the developing world, to the child whose city has been destroyed by a tsunami. We can do this. We can do it with space solar. The sun provides in an hour more energy than our civilization consumes in a year, but doesn't shine at night. By collecting sunlight in space, where it is brighter than anywhere on Earth and unaffected by clouds or night, we can then send that power wirelessly to the Earth, to wherever it's needed. Think of it as a sort of Hoover Dam in space. This approach supercharges the benefits of solar because it's always on. No other source can send the power anywhere. It's clean, constant, and global. This would provide energy for military operations, enabling resilient and flexible energy architectures. If a base moves or closes, energy can be sent where it's needed, when it's needed. It reduces risks and costs in dollars and lives. Similarly, space solar's global coverage means when disasters destroy power infrastructure, we can send the power quickly. Faster energy saves lives. In the developing world, reliable constant power from space solar can be used to fight the problems of water scarcity, poor health, lack of education, political instability, and unemployment. Being a leader in space solar would reframe our diplomacy we would foster partnerships with emerging nations, and we would make good on our commitments in Paris. There are other compelling reasons that it should be our nation rather than another that takes the lead. We would spawn new industries, create countless new jobs, benefit communications, reconnaissance, space exploration, and space resource utilization. Above all, this would energize the spirit that America does incredible things. Here's why we should do this now. Historically, satellites have been expensive and one of a kind. Within the last three years, large and small companies alike have shown how we can reduce the cost of satellites through mass production. Within the last two years, our lab and others have leveraged advances in electronics, and gossamer materials to increase power per pound many times over. And within just the last few months, two companies have recovered booster stages from rockets, unleashing the prospect of greatly reduced space access costs. These advances have changed the equation, bringing down to 1 20th the cost of energy for what we pay to send it to some forward bases. The question now is not if but when space solar is competitive with our cheapest sources of energy. We are not the only ones who have realized this. Opportunity is knocking. Here's how we get started. The challenges are uniquely suited to a task force comprised of defense, state, and US aid. Let's set it up now. Defense will take the lead with the engineering, with our international and domestic partners, and government and industry who are eager to start. State and U.S. aid will take the lead in marshalling resources and allocating responsibilities, much as was done for the birth of the communications satellite industry, for the International Space Station, and for the ITER Fusion Energy Project. They will build the critical coalition to allocate spectrum for wireless power. Next, the international team will ground test the wireless power link, building on the success of the Japanese demonstrations of last year. These first two steps can be accomplished within two years for about $10 million. Next, we'll move to space with a demonstration on the International Space Station involving countries worldwide. The lessons we learn will be applied to a Pathfinder mission in low Earth orbit 
able to send usable power all over the world, including to developing nations. These steps can be accomplished by 2021 if we start now for about $350 million, about the same amount of money that Americans spend annually on Halloween costumes for their pets. The development phase culminates with a pilot plant in geosynchronous orbit with the capacity to power over 150,000 homes. This can be built for about $10 billion, or less than a quarter of the cost of the Three Gorges Dam. Energy costs are low now, largely because of the availability of finite fossil fuels. Whether they run out in 10 years or 100 years, they will run out, and our nation must have a sustainable source to turn to. We don't want to exchange our dependence on foreign oil for a dependence on foreign space solar. This gives us the ability to respond quickly to disasters, to prevent wars, and to win the wars we can't prevent. No other source is clean, constant, and global. We have a choice. We can settle while others surge, or we can boldly lead a truly transformational technology. You have the power to move this forward. The first step of setting up the task force is easy. All of you have the power to move this forward. Let people know we have the opportunity to unlock a new era of energy. Let's lead and power a prosperous and secure future. Thank you. So uh, I'll tell you what, if you're ever feeling uh, sort of uh, not optimistic about the future, get a guy like Paul around and we'll change, uh, change your views pretty quickly. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, I now would like to hand over to General Salva and the panel for questions. Thank you, General. As you examine this particular innovation, did you get a chance to look at the potential power loss between the, the collectors in space, the receivers on the ground, as a consequence of moving power wirelessly? And what impact does that have on the scale of the array or arrays, plural, that you might have to build in space? Yeah, absolutely. So this concept has been studied quite a lot, and the wireless power is well understood. A lot of people are not familiar with wireless power. Actually, you know, you mentioned um, uh, the founders of Apple before and their small uh, prototype. I actually have here, uh, since people don't always understand about wireless power, uh, a demonstration that you can even collect the power that is transmitted from the Wi-Fi on your phone. And uh, so this is just an, an LED we call a rectenna, a, re a rectifying antenna. And hope, I don't know if you guys in the back will be able to see this. But, um, but this, is, this is just collecting the wireless power just from my Wi-Fi transmission. So the receiver would be made out of thousands of these. Uh, if you've ever seen a baseball game where they cover the infield when it starts raining, the deployment would be something like that. And you could really deploy as, as much as you needed. You would get about a megawatt per soccer field. That's the way to think about it. But the, uh, the efficiency of the wireless link itself is not the, uh, it's, it's very efficient. The greatest loss is actually in the photovoltaics. And an interesting point is that with space solar, the, like, so these are better than 90% efficient. And you have that on the ground, you don't have to worry about dissipating the heat. If you have solar panels on the ground, you have something that's 20% efficient maybe on the ground. So all of the inefficiency is in space. Thank you. What's the role of the private sector in this? Um, the private sector is definitely engaged. Northrop Grumman and Caltech actually have just recently in invested $17 million in the development of some of the component technologies. So a government investment undoubtedly would jumpstart a lot of IRAD in the, the private industry. There's a tremendous opportunity for international cooperation on this. The Japanese, as I mentioned, uh, are among the leaders in this technology. Uh, and the Chinese in the last 10 years have really taken a great interest in it. It's actually at a point where I, I can't even keep up with all the academic papers about space solar coming from China because it's really a, a burgeoning field there. Uh, so there's opportunities with companies not just domestically, our, our primes and startups. There's a startup in California that's trying to do this called Solarin. Uh, but certainly international companies and international governments have a, a great interest in this idea. Um, as I understand it, battery technology is also moving rapidly with uh, economies of scale and so forth. So can you take, me, take us through the pros and cons of, on the one hand, this, or alternatively, 
really good batteries connected to solar on the ground. Absolutely. Well, and that's the main trade for, for a lot of the scenarios, right? So you're going to have a, a shipping container. What do you put in it? Do you put in a rectangular receiver or do you put in solar arrays and batteries? And one of the problems, like storage is great and it has made improvements. We've been working on it for literally hundreds of years. Uh, you still don't know uh, when you're going to have that long, cloudy week that's going to make it so your battery's empty and you're done, right? This is continuous, so you have it all the time. Uh, solar and batteries are fabulous if you're in the desert at noon. Most places are not the desert at noon. Thank you. Thank you. Paul, oh, thank you.